If you're someone who's been told you weren't good enough, not big enough, not fast enough, not smart enough, or if you've ever felt paralyzed by a failure you just weren't willing to accept, this is the show for you. Hustle and Motivate is a blueprint built by guests who've overcome obstacles, silenced critics, and overcome adversity by seeing every failure as an opportunity, realizing the true power of the underdog mentality. This is Tyler O'Shea, and you're listening to Hustle and Motivate. Brittany Gilman spent the better part of her early life as an athlete, from skiing at two years old to snowboarding professionally to strength training, she was always driven to be the best. But after an internship turned out to be a complete waste of time, Brittany decided right then and there to launch her own sports agency. It wasn't easy, and she learned as she went along, but soon all the hard work paid off. Now, more than 10 years later, BG Sports Enterprises is an international brand development agency that's worked with the likes of Roman Harper, Ezekiel Elliott, Jermon Bushrod, and many others. Here is founder and CEO of BG Sports, Brittany Gilman. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and how you got started in sports? Well, I was the young, well, I am the youngest of three, grew up in Grand Junction, Colorado. My brother kind of set the standard for all of us siblings in terms of he was a very athletic and straight A student, and my sister followed in his footsteps. And so subconsciously, I think it was just kind of in me that this is really the only way to go through life by being the best that you can be and getting A's on everything and being the top athlete. So from a very young age, it was instilled in me, even if my parents didn't, you know, they they were never very pushy. They were never, you have to do this, you have to do that. But I think it was just an environment that really supported us and motivated us to kind of follow our dreams and giving us all of the necessary support, but also, you know, they, they let us do whatever we wanted to do and, and believed in our abilities to accomplish that. So I'm very, very grateful to my parents and my brother and sister and my, my entire family by always really supporting me to follow my dreams and kind of creating that standard from day one so that that type of motivation and drive is basically instilled in me. Mm -hmm. So That was growing up young, and I started skiing at age two and a half, snow skiing. Wow. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) My uh, dad put us on skis at a very young age and then used peanut M&Ms and would put them (laughs) in the snow. (laughs) And that would be how my mom and dad both taught us how to ski. And that was kind of the way for us to learn how to turn. Um, And they would use the leashes. So even at a young age, you have a little leash attached to you, to your, then to your parents. So I never was able to kind of get too much out of control, but that was also something from a very young age that I was introduced to a lot of sports as well as water skiing. I think I got up on one water ski when I was seven or eight. And that was, our family has a, my grandparents have a cabin up in the mountains, on a beautiful lake. And that was kind of the summers for us. So lots of cousins and we all were in a quick rush to see who could get up on one ski first. And then we would ride it on the cabin wall and it was just this big thing. So I think from a very young age, I was taught to be fearless. And that's something that our society focuses on instilling in people is fear. So for me, it was kind of from a very young age, I'm water skiing and skiing, ski racing. And then when I was 12, I decided to rebel and I wanted to snowboard, which at the time was not positively looked upon by most skiers as they thought snowboarders were annoying and called them knuckle draggers <laughs> and hoodlums and things of that nature. But I was very drawn to snowboarding. So I let's see my, after my, I think it was 11 when I competed in the junior Olympics for skiing and did pretty well. I think I got third and, or no, actually I won the slalom. 
uh, in Crested Butte, Colorado. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to rebel and I am going to become a snowboarder and be the only one in my family to snowboard. And that's, that's what I did. And I ended up falling head over heels in love with the sport. And in high school, when it came time to decide as you get older and you kind of have to make choices, where do I really want to focus my energy? I chose snowboarding because it was the most fun out of all the sports that I participated in. And thus that was the beginning of my snowboard journey. And I started competing within two years, I think of learning. And I was competing professionally by the time I was 17 and made the junior Olympic snowboard team when I was 19 and for five years competed professionally, traveled all over, did tremendous amount of competitions and photo shoots and had sponsors. And this was all while I was getting my undergraduate degree at University of Colorado. So that was a quite challenging time period as I had to split my time between competing professionally in snowboarding and studying kinesiology, which was the equivalent of pre-med. Um, so with that mindset where, okay, you have to get straight A's while being a professional athlete, it was quite a, a challenging time for me trying to put all that energy into both goals, which required so much energy. So it was a really interesting time in my life when I did all that. You said you saw like the snowboarding thing is like a rebellious thing to do. How long did it take your parents to support you with that? They supported me from day one. My mom, she was never in her mind that she wanted me to do this or that. She was more along the lines of she wanted us to be happy. So whatever we wanted to do, as long as we were safe, she would support it. And my dad, he never, he gave me a hard time for a little while, but same type thing. He was very much supportive in terms of realize that I was very passionate towards snowboarding. So although he wasn't very happy initially, eventually he realized that this was something that I really loved and he ended up supporting me tremendously throughout my entire snowboard career. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but I still to this day get a little bit of push from my family, but it's only, it's all in love. <laughs> and what was the transition like from skiing to snowboarding? Cause it's all, I mean, it's a lot different. Yeah, they're totally different. It was, I used to skateboard when I was a teenager. Okay. And so that was kind of what wanted me to learn to snowboard even more so was because I, when I was in middle school, I thought it was super cool. And I was a bit of a skater chick and, uh, I was okay at skateboarding. I was never anywhere near where I could compete. So I figured, well, I could be a snowboarder and I'm a really good skier. So I could become a really good snowboarder and that way I could still be really cool, but yet kind of have my own niche. And so that's kind of what enables or drove me to begin to snowboard and just kind of take off with it running. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad of a transition. And when you're 12 years old, you can learn how to do anything within a few days, you know? So it was pretty, uh, pretty quick. Yeah. But turning pro, I mean, you, you went pro pretty quickly from what it sounds like. Yeah. I think again, that's just, you know, I, I've skied from such a young age and then was competing in the junior Olympics. And then I, I also ran track for, one season my freshman year because I missed the soccer tryouts. I think it was, I missed six or seven of 10 days of soccer tryout showed up on say day seven and was expecting to make the team and I didn't make the team. So I was, had a little ego back then and was like, fine, I'll run track. And then ended up running my freshman year in track. I got third in state in the two mile after training for two, three months. So I think it's, it, it was just kind of in me that there was no other option but to be the best at what you do in your sport. And I kind of had that mentality through every sport that I did. So there was really no other option. So with snowboarding, it was the same. It was like the only option is to be the best. So how do we get there? And you do everything within your power to accomplish that and you just expect it. And so 
for me, it was just kind of the only way to snowboard was I'm going to be competing at the professional level. So what do I need to do to get there? And then implementing everything in between to accomplish that goal. So where do you think that mindset came from? I mean, you mentioned your parents. I'm guessing it had it might have had something to do with the peanut M&Ms. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all in the magical powers of <laughs> peanut M and M's. <laughs> but I think I I often wonder about this because I, I always try to question where did this drive come from, mm -hmm. and I just honestly feel like it's in my DNA, and it maybe comes from I'm part Viking, so perhaps it's the Viking blood within me. Mm -hmm. This just this drive that is is always there and it comes through in everything that I do and it's very difficult to describe it but I felt it my entire life so I think that I was never in a place where I was pressured growing up it was always we support you to do whatever you want to do that makes you happy and I am forever grateful to my family for raising me in such an incredible environment that cultivated creativity and hard work but never doubted me in terms of, oh, you want to go to Europe when you're 19 by yourself. Okay, we trust you. We're going to support you to do this. So I think it's just from day one, as soon as I came to this earth, it was kind of something, it was an environment that I was raised in. And again, it's just, it's in my DNA. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly where it comes from. But yeah, I think my my family, my DNA, my grandparents and mm -hmm ancestors <laughs> so it's just in me <laughs> and you mentioned it earlier you know balancing the college workload while you were traveling with the olympic team how, how did you manage all that stuff well it was it was the junior olympic team so we it wasn't like traveling with the olympic team so i have to be sure i'm clear on that because okay. this was when i was 19 so the junior yeah. olympic team you still have to then make the olympic team um so just to make sure we get that right but that was it was tremendously difficult. I was very young. I, I went to college when I was 17 and graduated when I was 21. So or 22, December, um, I'm an August baby. So I graduated in December. I did four and a half years to graduate college because during the winters I would miss, I would go to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I would miss Thursday and Friday of almost every week because I had to travel to competitions. So to me, the most one of the biggest things when I look back at this time in my life and you realize how much, how much of sport is mental, the mental game that you play, mm -hmm. you can have the physical capabilities, but so much of it is the ability to translate the physical capabilities into controlling the mental part and snowboarding. Cause I competed in the half pipe. It's so much mental. You can, learn a trick and create your run for half pipe, which if you're not familiar with the half pipe, it's a very long U jump on a slope and you go, you drop in and you go up the wall, you do a trick and you land and you come back down. And so depending on how long the pipe is, you're doing, you know, six to 10 tricks. And so you can learn these tricks and practice them over and over and over and over. But when it comes to competing, and you're standing at the top of the half pipe ready to drop in with who knows how many people watching you, television and whatnot. And this goes for every sport. It's the mindset and the mental that is going to determine how well you perform. And because during my competitive years, I was studying kinesiology, which was all the sciences. So we're talking physics, chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry kinesiology, calculus, all these, these incredible subjects that require a tremendous amount of brain power. I feel as though I never fully accomplished my ultimate level, which I could have snowboarding while I was competing because so much of my mental energy was put into school mm -hmm. and studying. And I did, I wouldn't let myself not get great grades. So that to me is, is the one thing in my life where I look back and I always wonder if I were to have focused 100% my mental energy on snowboarding, who knows where else I could have taken it. So 
having to learn how to balance that was tremendously difficult, all while trying to balance having an actual life. Because I spent almost all of my time studying, training, traveling, or competing. That it was very much kind of all over the board. So it was um, it was really challenging, you know. And um, I think that I learned a lot and am able now, present day, to to balance a lot of things. But I, I still, it's the one thing in my life where I always wonder, <laughs> what if? <laughs> yeah. And after graduation, you did pursue the snowboarding full time, right? I did, but for a very short period of time. I graduated in December, and I moved to Mammoth Lakes, California. And I was so excited to snowboard full time, and I just couldn't wait. So I moved to the mecca of snowboarding, and I was very blessed to have my dad pay or my family pay for my undergraduate. But as soon as I graduated, they cut me off. Mm -hmm. So I now was free to do whatever I wanted, wherever I wanted. I had my degree. I had all these things I had accomplished. And now I'm let out into the real world. So I moved to Mammoth. I had no money. And I wanted to just snowboard full time. My living arrangements were very interesting because I didn't have any income. So I had to figure out a way to pay for rent. So I lived in an A-frame with three guys and none of them had money. So and this is in the middle of the winter. <laughs> so we lived in this A-frame in Mammoth and no one had money to pay for heat really. So we kept the thermostat at 60 degrees. Oh, now, gosh. mind you, we're living in a mountain town in the middle of winter where you're getting three feet of snow in three hours and nobody wants to pay for heat. So it was freezing in our house and we had a wood burning stove, which we would keep full of wood, but we had to pay for wood as well. Um, so that was really interesting. I got a job at a country club as a trainer because at that time when I was in college, I also got certified as a um, strength conditioning spe specialist and a personal trainer. Because while I was in school and snowboarding, I had another goal of thinking, okay, when I'm done snowboarding, I want to be the first female strength and conditioning coach in the NFL. So that was something that I was also working towards knowing when I'm done snowboarding, this will be my next career. So I got a job as a trainer and we didn't have any warm water at the house. So I would shower at work and I didn't really have any money. So I bought an airbed from Walmart at the time and it somehow got a hole in it. So I would go to sleep on this air mattress and then I'd wake up on the floor. <laughs> Jeez. So that was kind of my, the time in my life where it was very, very challenging. I was actually, I was very depressed during that time. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was so excited to graduate and then you graduate and it's like, okay, now what? Oh, you have to earn money to pay for all these bills, but yet you want to snowboard full time and you're not making a lot of money snowboarding. So it was really challenging. And then I, I switched my boot sponsors and I ended up developing these things called pump bumps, which were growths kind of like a bone spur, but it was all a result of the pressure of the boots that were pushing that I didn't realize when I first got them. So I actually was injured almost that entire season and I couldn't even train. So it was a very depressing time for me. And that's when I needed to take, I decided to take a break. And I was only up there one season and I, I was just miserable. And I decided to move to Los Angeles to take an internship at University of Southern California with the football team as a strength conditioning coach. So I moved down to Los Angeles, was doing this internship for the summer. And at the end of the summer, they said that I could stay the whole season. And this is back when USC was going on its third yeah. national championship. So I ended up staying in Los Angeles. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And what was that experience like? I mean, they had a bunch of studs on that and those teams. Oh, my goodness. That was – there's nothing you could compare to that experience, yet at the same time probably one of the most challenging years of my life. And it, it was my initiation into working into a male-dominated environment. There was only two women that were working in the weight room, myself and one other coach. And the rest was men. And we're talking men in college, 
men that were right out of college doing graduate assistantship positions all the way up to your head coach, which was Coach Carroll at the time, which I'm very, very grateful to have had the opportunity to work under such an icon and inspiring individual. So that was just a tremendous experience, but yet it was also a very hostile experience as people did not want me to succeed. There were a few that did, but the majority did not. So they did a lot of things that challenged me and, and made it a very uncomfortable working environment as well as being a female. And, you know, to this day I look back and I'm like, well, shoot, there's probably a lot of things that I could have, you know, probably a lot of illegal stuff going on in terms of how I was treated and the things they made me do. And, you know, but again, it, it built character and it really kind of, it hardened me up, which is terrible to say, but when you work in sports in an environment such as this, you really have to have thick skin. And coming from Colorado where you assume everyone's great, you're very friendly, you're very genuine to USC football, where you're surrounded by Los Angeles and the entertainment industry, tons of money everywhere and a ton of egos. So it was quite the learning experience for me. And it was, I could, I'm, I'm actually writing a book um, on this entire process and my life and everything that's led me to this point. But my years at USC is going to be a few chapters. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So it was, it was challenging. But at the same time, you're working with the number one college football team in the country full of superstars. We're talking Reggie Bush, Linda White, Dwayne Jarrett, Frosty Rucker, Clay Matthews. I mean, I could go on and on about the guys on that team. And you you ended up at Auburn after that? Yes. So I was at USC for a year. I was unpaid during that year, mind you. So I would work, I'd be at work around 5.45 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning in time for 6 a.m. workouts. And I wouldn't leave until probably 6.37 p.m. And then I would go work my personal training job. At the time, I was working at the Gold's Gym downtown L.A. And I would work my personal training job for about three to four hours. And then I would go home and do it all over again. And all my money went to rent because I rent was so expensive. And I wasn't only getting paid you know, a couple hours a day. So that was just... 24 seven working. And I did that for a year. And then I realized that there wasn't any paid positions or opportunities for me to progress at USC. So I applied to a few universities and then ended up getting a graduate assistant position at Auburn University as a strength conditioning coach where they were going to pay for my postgraduate degree as well as pay me a monthly stipend. So it was a great opportunity for me. And I would also have the opportunity to coach my own teams. So I took this position. I went to Auburn. I coached men and women's long distance track, men and women's diving, and then women's tennis. So I did not work football this year when I was at Auburn. And I realized during the time that I was at Auburn that being a strength conditioning coach wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. Although I did love working with athletes, I wanted to work with football again. And I wanted to kind of learn the business side of sports, which at the time I had no real experience in marketing or PR or digital branding or anything like that. I had only experienced being an agent slash manager of myself, getting my own sponsorships, and then clearly the training and athlete perspective of the industry. So Auburn was tremendous. I absolutely loved it. I was only there a year, finished my master's in a year, and then moved back to LA to pursue my sports marketing career. And this entire time, I was still thinking in the back of my head, okay, I'm going to go back to snowboarding when I'm ready, because I always had it, and I just wanted to take a break from snowboarding. And it just so happened that I just had momentum in this other area area and this other goal of mine that kept coming and I just never went back to competing and snowboarding which is bizarre to me to this day because I'm just like I just stopped it wasn't that anything crazy happened I just changed my focus to another area another goal path 
of mine and and I just continued on that path. So that's always really interesting because I get asked why did I stop snowboarding and it, it wasn't any anything definitive. It just kind of happened. Um but yeah, so moved to LA, got an internship at a sports marketing agency. They basically told me, we don't need your services, but if you want to come into the office and observe, you're welcome to. So I was only there for two months, maybe realized it was a complete waste of my time because I was- So did you move back there just for that internship? Yeah. I mean, it it was for the internship, but it was also uh, Auburn. For the opportunity. Yeah. Like I just, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to pursue this, this career in Auburn, Alabama. And so I knew I had to be somewhere. And L.A. was where I had lived. That's where all my friends were. I had family in L.A. So I just decided, where is the best place for me to accomplish this? And, oh, I got an internship. So, yes, move back to L.A. So I did that. And then I was only there two months. And I decided, you know what? I'm just going to start my own agency. I know professional athletes. I'll learn this as I go. So I started BG Sports in 2007. My very first client was Roman Harper, who at the time was a young player out of Alabama who played for the Saints. So I called Roman and I said, Roman, we should work together. And Roman laughed and was like, well, what are you going to do, B? And I said, just give me the opportunity. Just just let me, let me show you. We'll do marketing, brand partnerships, endorsements. Just let me show you. And Roman did. And I worked for Roman for two years before he ever paid me. And during that time was just learning, learning how to build my network, learning how to, what is PR? How do you do PR? Who, who do you speak to? How can you leverage a player to get opportunities? And I learned everything as I went. And I worked at the same time I got a job as a trainer. Well, I was working as a trainer. So that's what paid my bills while trying to build my company up. Um, and at the gym, I met a VP of a very successful international shoe company, which ended up hiring me as their international sports marketing director, which was tremendous because that enabled me to stop training and now insert myself into the sports marketing industry with an established organization. And then from there, I was Worked for them for about a year and a half, maybe two years. And then after that, I went full-time with BG Sports. And since then, it's just been a tremendous whirlwind of <laughs> how many years now? I don't even want to say it, over 10 years of just nonstop hustling and grinding and growing. And yeah, so that's quite a long story, but that's kind of the cliff notes of my my journey to date. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the early days is what, like, I'm so interested in how you actually learned everything on your own. Like, what did your day look like when you, you're like, okay, I'm Roman Harper's agent. Like, what did the average day look like for you? Well, it was a lot of research and creative thinking, figuring out, I'm working with this player, but he's not a superstar. So we have to build his image and his public persona. So how do we do that? Well, through PR. Okay. What is PR? So I'm online, I'm researching, I'm looking at other athletes, I'm looking at their websites and their profiles. And it was just a lot of information that you're seeking to learn and understand how the industry works. A lot of trial and error. And that's what the digital branding and everything, Chad Ochocinco was one of the first athletes to really capitalize on what is Twitter, and, mm-hmm. and how beneficial is this for me? And he kind of, he he was the founding fathers kind of of the digital media. And this is before Instagram. We had Facebook, or first we had MySpace. And then there was Facebook. And then comes Twitter. And then comes Instagram, which, of course, we all know has changed our entire world, has changed so many different industries. And it's bizarre that one thing could could have such a worldwide impact. So before all that, it was just a matter of research and, and learning and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's contact this company. Let's pitch to this company. Let's work with this company. And it was just, you learn as you go. And to me, that's the best way to learn. You can sit in a classroom and read books and take notes and listen to people speak. But unless you actually do it yourself, that's the quickest and best way to learn how to do anything. 
is actually experiencing it, having to problem solve, having to deal with real world issues real communication with individuals and learning how to deal with different types of individuals and types of personalities. And so it was just, and I'm learning every single day. It it never stops. We're going to learn our entire lives. I think a lot of it is you need to be open to learning and you need to understand that you might be an expert at something, but there's someone that's better at it than you and someone that can do things much more efficiently. So It's kind of, you know, being an athlete, you're always looking to critique yourself and be the best version of yourself. And that's kind of what it was. And to this day, it still is. And that's what you, that's the mentality that you have to have in this industry to be successful because it's so competitive. It's so competitive. And expanding from your first client in Roman Harper, I mean, how how did that work? I mean, I'm sure it involved all the networking, relationship building. And can you kind of tell people, you know, people who want to work in sports, how they can build their network? Well, I think one of the most important things to understand is that your reputation is worth more than any amount of money you could ever receive. And your reputation is built through your interaction with other individuals. And especially in sports and entertainment and these industries where so much of it is, quote, entertainment such as sports is entertainment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of dishonesty. There's a lot of others using each other and others viewing another individual as a stepping stone. What can you do for me? How can I use you to get to where I want to go? And these are things that I was raised with integrity, characters, character, to come from a place of pure intent, to always do the right thing, to to never take advantage of individuals that were all equal human, no matter if it's someone working as a janitor versus someone as a president of um, a massive corporation. We're all humans at the end of the day. And so that mindset and never seeing myself as better than anybody has been, and it's tremendously difficult to maintain that mindset when you're in an industry with so many poor characters and people take advantage of you and they'll lie and they'll, it's just, it's a really nasty industry. And so that's something that I think, and again, I'm so grateful to my family and my parents for raising me with such, you know, honesty and integrity, because even though it's challenged all the time, that type of mindset and the mindset where you're here to help the world, you're not here to take advantage of anyone. You, you you know that, okay, I'm great at this. This person is great at this. This person's great at this. And you maintain your humility that will surpass any overnight fame. Or even if someone suddenly accomplishes something great, how did they get there? How did they get to that point? What was their intent? to get to that point because that type of intent will not last. So that's for me, like you think, okay, no matter what you do, no matter what your experience day in and day out, you have to, you got to focus on yourself. Like can you look at yourself in the mirror at the end of every single day and truly say, I was the best person I could be today. And if not being able to say, you know what? I was judgmental today or I lied or I, cheated or whatever the case may be, you got to be honest with yourself because ultimately you're the only person you're guaranteed to go to bed with for the rest of your life. So it's that internal fight that so many people, you know, some, a lot of people don't have the strength or the, maybe they weren't taught or raised in an environment that instilled integrity and honesty, you know? So yeah, I kind of got off track. (laughs) I forgot your question. No, (laughs) I know what you mean. Like the, the nature of the business is like you can't like you can't always be, I guess, 100 percent honest. Right. I mean, no, you can. You you always I mean, I'm always honest, but I think you you can't trust everybody. Yeah. So you have to understand that just because you're a good person and you would never do something, it doesn't mean that other people are that way. Mm hmm. And that's one of the biggest challenges that to this day I face every day. It's like, just because you would never do something, it doesn't mean that they won't do it 
And if they do do it, you can't be surprised because you really can't put anything past anybody. And every individual will reveal his true character given time. Mm-hmm. And that's something that is true across all industries. People's actions show their character. So if, if someone is in an industry and they may not be driven by the right things or they may be out to kind of take advantage of people, at some point their true colors will show because the truth always comes out no matter what. So it's kind of where if, I, if I'm in a situation and there's someone playing dirty, it's so difficult because it's so easy to, to drop down to someone's level. Mm. It's much harder to stay above it but you have to stay above it. If you want to truly be successful and be successful for the right reasons, you always have to rise above and you just got to say, you know what? You guys can go play in the mud and be dirty because that's not who I am. And no matter what you do, I'm not going to come to that level. So go ahead, play in the mud. I'm going to come over here and continue on my path. And that's often very hard to do because sometimes you feel as though people can make you look bad. People take advantage of you and in this industry, in the sports industry, I run into it a lot. And it's really, it, it rattles you to the core. Mm-hmm. It, and things happen where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they would do that. But they do. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a very, very challenging industry. So I do tell a lot of people that when they want to get into the sports industry, you kind of have to understand what you're getting yourself into. And you have to have extremely thick skin. Because if you don't, there's no way that you're going to reach a high level of success. People, you will be eaten alive. So that's that's something that I have to communicate properly. And I, I'm always very honest with people. So. I don't want to get us too off track, but have you ever seen Ballers on HBO? Oh, yes. That's the perfect representation of my life. How accurate would you say that is? It's it's extremely accurate. I, I like to say to people who don't who are unfamiliar with sports and how the industry works, I often say that. My lifestyle is a mix between Jerry Maguire and Ballers. So it's, it's, I've been very blessed to work with so many incredible athletes. And I've worked with other incredible athletes that have been a bit challenging. <laughs> but it's, it's all been for learning and, and whatnot. And I've had some crazy experiences. But that's a very, very accurate show. Very wow. accurate. <laughs> So getting back to BG Sports, can you give our listeners a kind of an overview of what your agency offers? Yes. So present day, we are an international branding agency. So based in Los Angeles, this is our headquarters, but we're also based in London, which has been over the past four years, one of our main focuses in terms of expanding internationally and how can we offer additional services that very few can offer to our clients, athletes, brands, and media that kind of can take their their company and brand to the next level. So we offer services from brand development, brand launches, and international branding, which includes, because it's kind of branding is a bit of the umbrella that overlooks all of the other services. And then the other services, marketing, public relations and media, events, meaning production of events and access to events, business development, creating brands, launching brands, managing brands, handing those brands back to our clients when they're ready, community relations, philanthropy, um, and also now we have expanded a bit into lifestyle services, so concierge as well as, say, for example, athletes that want to tap into the European fashion world. So that's something that we also provide. And on an entire different level, we were in development of an app and a platform that I basically created to put BG Sports out of business. So that's a tremendous project. It's called BPOP. It stands for Brand Promotional Opportunities. It's an app and a website that we've been developing for six years and hopefully we'll be launching within the next six months. So that's a completely separate but very relevant project that I've been working on as well. <laughs> wow, that's really exciting. I mean, yeah. to, to think it all started as just, you know, one woman show. And mm. it, is it still a small, like, is it still a small business, small company? Well, we're, you could say we're a boutique agency, but 
because of the nature of the business, we're not an agency that has just full-time employees all the time. Yeah. Because our projects and clients, they shift and they work and they're all over the world. So it's really the way I've basically developed the company is that we have a lot of people that work with BG Sports, but a lot of them are, okay, they're working with us these three months of the year or these six months or maybe just a month. Maybe we need assistance with one of our big events in London and I have to bring in five people that work with us in the UK. So due to the nature of the industry and how things change and shift and mold, that's kind of the way that I created the company. And so we have partners worldwide, which is tremendous all over Europe and all over the U S. So it's quite the group of individuals that are tremendously talented. And I'm so grateful to have so many inspiring people that are part of our team. So I just have one more question. I could ask you so many questions, but I don't want to take too much time. But um, going back to the time you're on that air bed or whatever, you're waking up and you're not really sure what you're doing with your life. And I'm sure there's a lot of kids out there that just graduated college and they're not sure what they're doing. What advice do you have to people like that who, you know, they are internally driven, but maybe they haven't found their purpose yet? I think if you don't know what your purpose is, because even to this day, like I still get confused. I think it's figuring out what are your passions because life is very short. If we're lucky, we grow old and it it goes by faster and faster. So the most important thing to me is that you're happy and that every day you enjoy what you do and you wake up and you're excited to work. If you wake up and you look at the clock and you say, oh, gosh, I have to get up. I have to go to work. I have to do this. When you're at work, if you're just looking at the clock, you can't wait for your lunch break. You can't wait to get off work. And then you get off work and you feel like you're free. That may not necessarily be your passion. So if you don't know what your passion is, you just have to start paying attention to where you're the most happy. What are you doing when you feel as though you're in bliss? What are you doing when time seems to stop and you're completely in that moment, being in that moment 100% fully? Those are the moments that if you pay attention to can help lead you to your passions because not everyone even knows what their passions are. Not all of us have ever even been exposed to what our true passion is. You might happen to be on a trip somewhere and you might meet someone or you might be introduced to a book that'll change your entire world. So I think it's a matter of just trying to pay attention to the present moment and being in that moment and and paying attention to what your heart tells you. If you love something, there's a way to make a money doing way to make money doing it. I created my company out of absolutely nothing. I created my dream job and I'm still creating my dream job. And it, and I've been able to live a very successful life by creating something out of nothing. So I think that's what's so important is to understand how powerful we all are, how powerful your mind is, what you can create anything you want, but it's letting go of the fear, first and foremost, not feeling sorry for yourself, not feeling as though you're a victim of circumstance, because we are all so blessed especially present day. And there's, you know, clearly we still have a ton of inequality and racism and sexism in our world, but at least humans are aware now. And there's many humans that are working to make this change our world and uplift humanity. So not feeling victim to circumstance and just focusing on the present moment, focusing on what you have, I have a family. I have friends. Even if you feel like you don't have a lot, you have something. So focus on that. And, and that will help you to kind of decipher between, okay, I don't know what I want to do. I'm lost. I don't know what my passions are, but I know in this moment I'm happy. So maybe, maybe that means something. Maybe there's something I could do that I don't know exists yet in this space. That's going to lead me to my greatest joy. Because at the end of the day, in my beliefs, that's one of the most important things is making sure that we enjoy what we're do, what we do. We're all given gifts. Some of us are better at certain things than the others. And that's a gift that we've been given to give back to humanity. So find that gift, find that passion, 
and go for your dreams and know that you can accomplish whatever you want to do. There's no limits except the limits that we impose upon ourselves. So that's my, that's my piece of advice <laughs> for the young minds that are out there looking to accomplish greatness. <laughs> Have you ever done any public speaking? I've done a few. I did a, um, let's see, I spoke to some students at Ohio State several years ago, which I loved and was very fun. And I've, I guess when I look back to my strength conditioning days, that's basically public speaking yeah. <laughs> in front of massive groups of athletes. But besides that, I haven't done too much. I would, I would love to do more uh, public speaking. Yeah, I definitely. Mean, that and your book, I mean, I, your story can help a lot of people is what I'm saying. And you can just feel the, the energy and the drive in your voice. Oh, thank you very much. That means a lot. <laughs> so before we wrap things up, do you want to tell people where they can find you and how they can support what you got going on? Yes, of course. Social media is the easiest way to see what is up to date and going on. Our company social media account is at BG Sports Ent Inc. So that's B G S P O R T S E N T I N C. And that's also our Facebook page and our Twitter. My personal page is at BG Sport, S P O R T, and that's on Instagram and Twitter. And then obviously Facebook, you can just put in Brittany Gilman and you will see uh, my personal page and my profile. Um, our website is bgseinc.com. Awesome. And I'm going to put all that in the write up. Everyone will be able to easily get to it. So Brittany, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your, out of your day to come on the show. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. It's been quite the pleasure. If this conversation added any value to your life or taught you something new or helped you think about things a little bit differently, you don't have to subscribe. You don't have to leave a review. All I ask is that you just tell one friend. We don't care about the numbers. We don't care about the stats and all that stuff. What we do care about is impacting lives. And by telling someone about the show, you're helping us do that. So thanks for tuning in. And remember, Hustle and Motivate is brought to you by JokerMag.com, the home of the underdog.